We thank God for the privilege to be able to come into this place today. Glory to God. We have your Bibles. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the 21st chapter of the book of Genesis. The 21st chapter of the book of Genesis. We're going to begin our reading at verse number one. But prior to me uh, starting, I want to read a praise report that I got. I just, it just knocked me off my feet. I was just... I was kind of like Shirley Caesar on Saturday when I got this email. I said, hold my mute. I'm going to shout right here, okay? Then if you don't want to shout with me, that's okay. Just get out of my way because I'm going to shout. She says, this, this, I got this praise report. It says, good morning, Pastor Adams. I want to share with you what God has done. I've been at my current job for 10 years now, and I've been wanting to leave, leave this job for about a year now and really started putting in an effort and looking for a job. I can honestly say that over the last 10 years, my giving has been up and down. How many have been up and down? She says, I haven't consistently given tithes and offers like I should, and it's not that I didn't know what God's word said, but I wasn't committed in that area like I should have been. There have been some messages that have literally slapped me in the face about giving, and I would start giving and then get off track and stop giving again. In February of this year, I rededicated my life to Christ and also prayed that I would have the faith to give my tithes and offerings uh, that I could, that I could get my tithes and offering no matter what circumstances came my way. I didn't want to rob God anymore. I had enough. So every time I got paid, I would pay my tithes first, not out of a ritual, but I wanted to make sure God received his 10% before anything else. She says, if I for some reason forgot to pay my tithes on that day, I would hear a little whisper say, don't forget to pay your tithes. The little voice would remind me all day until I would sit down on my phone and pay my tithes. I know that reminder was the Holy Spirit without a doubt. So fast forward, I interviewed for a job back in February and I felt like the interview went well. I interviewed along with several other candidates that day. She says, well, COVID-19 happened and the state wouldn't allow any hiring to take place. So about two months ago, I received an email that stated, if you're still interested in the job you applied for in February, please submit a new application. So I did, and I received a follow-up email the next month to say they would be interviewing soon. I received a call about three weeks ago about setting up the interview. I had the interview, and it went well. She said there was about five candidates that interviewed for that job, and some of those, listen to this, some of those had a higher education than I have and more experience, but God. Everybody say, but God. Then about a week ago, I, I, I received a text message from one of my references who stated, I'm praying for you to get that job because I had someone reach out to me to verify your character and your work ethic. That's why you got to, amen, do what you got to do in the way God wants you to be done because people will check on you. Can I get a witness? After that, I received some text messages out of the blue from people I know who wanted to who wanted to just let me know that they were praying for me and my job situation. After that, I received a call from my current boss who let me know that she had received a call about a reference and to let me know she had given me a good reference. So my heart was just pounding and I was so excited, but I still had not received a call saying that I got the job. Well, after a little while, I received a call uh, offering me the, the new job and I was excited and happy. But listen to this. But when I opened my conditional offer letter, it showed me receiving $10,000 plus more per year in my annual salary. She says, God is good to his people. He's blessing in the midst of this pandemic, and I'm grateful and thankful for his faithfulness when I don't even deserve it. I just wanted to share this testimony, listen to me, with you, and thank you for teaching the word over the last 25 years. Now, you know, when I started shouting, when I went to Genesis, the 21st chapter, in verse number 21, because we come to the text that we've been watching uh, and looking at a, the family that God chose to birth the Savior in the earth ram through. We're looking at Abraham and Sarah. And as we come into this 21st chapter, guys, guess what? It's been 25 years since the promise was given. 25 years since the promise was first given to Abraham and Sarah, to Abraham in particular, that you're going to be the father of many nations. So when I saw it, I'm like, my goodness, God, you are such a good God. And I don't know about care how long it takes if you learn to trust him and believe in his word. He shall, he will bring it to pass. Can I get one witness out there today? He will do it. Glory to God. So as we come to the words of our text, uh, in this 21st chapter. Again, 25 years have passed from the time of God's promise to Abraham and Sarah. 
and the fulfillment of that promise here in our text today. And as we've been sharing over the past few weeks, God had to take both Abraham and Sarah through a process before bringing the promise to fulfillment. There are some things, guys, in our lives that God may have shown us and he has ordained and destined us to walk in, but there's a preparation period that we got to go through. There's a process that he has to take us through to get us to the point to where we can handle the assignment that he has for us. And, and what I'm going to encourage you today to do, because we're talking about me and my dysfunctional family, and a lot of the dysfunctionality that we experience in our families of origin, in our church family, in our family as a nation of Americans, a lot of that dysfunctionality, if you're not careful, will rob you and prevent you from moving into your God-ordained destiny. So I want to encourage you today that whatever's going on in your life, just know and trust, like this prayer report, if you just be obedient, God will bring it to pass. Can I get a witness? So, so if, if you will, look with me uh, at chap, chapter 21, verse number one. Let's, let's read that together. Genesis chapter 21, verse number one. The text says this. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Next verse says what? For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God has spoken to him. Next verse says what? Uh, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, he called him Isaac. The text says in the next verse, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac being eight days old as God had commanded him. Verse five says what? And Abraham was what? A hundred years old, when his son Isaac was born unto him. Now guys, let's, let's flip back to that 17 chapter and look at verses one and two, and I wanna look at verses 15 and 19, because I, I need you all to hear this. He was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. Glory to God. This promise was given 25 years ago, so that means he was how old when the promise came? Do the math, do the math. 25 years, <laughs> come on, 25 years old when the promise was first given. And now we are 25 years later, Constant, it's coming into manifestation. I want to know how many of y'all are wait, how many of y'all are willing to wait 25 weeks for the Lord to answer you? How many of y'all are wait, some of y'all can't wait 25 minutes. And you give up on what God has told you. His promises, amen, are true, and my God cannot lie. Look at what the text says here in Genesis 17, verse number one. The text says, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to him, Abram, and said unto him, he was 90 years old and nine when the Lord appeared. This is the second time. The first time he was, what, 75, correct? And now he comes back to reassure him that what he promised when he was 75, I know you're 99, Abe, eh? come on. I know you're 99, that's 24 years, but I'm gonna bring this thing to pass. I know you've been waiting for a long time. I know you've had some, some dysfunctionality in how you've handled yourself. I know I had to grow you to the point that you could receive and be obedient to my word. So it says, he says, he was 99 years old and nine. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Verse number two, let's read together. It says what? And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee how exceedingly. Go, back, go down to verse number 15 with me right quick. Talking about me and my dysfunctional family. Because y'all know Abraham uh, in the midst of this journey that we're watching him go on, I told you when we look in Romans and we see how he ends up, he wasn't always there. He had some stuff going on. Two times, guys, he allowed his wife to be taken into the king's harem to save his own skin. And I told you on last week, that's a hard thing to, to swallow because a man should be his wife's protector and his provider. Can I get a witness? A man should, 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 should die to live. There's a, there's a, in our men's study uh, on authentic manhood, there's a, a paradox principle that we uh, have studied. This, and it says we die to ourselves in order to truly live. We die to live. See, Paul understood that principle because in Galatians 2 and 20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not I, but Christ does what? Lives in me. 
And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Glory to God. Died to live. You're going to die to live, men. Don't do like Abraham did in, in his early journey of faith. In his early journey of faith, Abraham was not practicing the paradox principle where he died to live. That is a paradox. How are you going to die and live at the same time? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I do what? I live. So Abraham is on this journey to being a spiritual leader because if you're going to be a servant, a spiritual leader, a servant leader in your family, you as a, as a, as a husband can't be giving your wife a way to save your skin. And that's literally what was happening. Because you remember the culture that day, whenever King saw a beautiful woman and she happened to be married, he would kill the woman, not, not the woman, he will kill the husband to get the woman, right? If he knew that they were husband and wife. But if the husband was the brother, come on, then now he would take care of the brother because he's taking the wife, the brother's, the so-called brother's wife into his harem. But I want to tell you something. That's not a servant leader. A servant leader is a spiritual leader. A servant leader is someone who's an emotional encourager for his spouse. He don't give her a way to save his skin. A, a, a servant leader is a financial provider. And a servant leader is a physical protector. But Abraham, Abraham wasn't there yet. He had to get to that point to where he could fulfill the promise. So we go down to verse number 15 of this 17 chapter. Let's keep moving here because, again, I want us to see that the family that God chose to birth the Savior in the earth realm through had a lot of dysfunctionality. And we're going to see it throughout the history of that family. But I'm here to tell you, God still used them to bring the Savior into the earth realm. And God can still use you, use your family, even though there's been some messed up stuff that's went on in your family of origin. God says, I can still take you if you will be obedient to me and use you to do kingdom business here on earth. Can I get a witness? Text says this, and God said unto Abraham, as far as Sarah, or Sarah, thy wife, thou shalt not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name now. Sarah shall her name be. Watch what the text says. Keep reading in verse number 16. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Keep reading. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is 99 years old bear? Look at the next verse, 90 years old bear. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Now, he, he's talking about Israel, the, the, the outside child. Come on. The child that came from when Sarah tried to hook it up. How many of y'all wise brothers have ever, ever tried to hook the thing up? I, I, brothers don't want to talk today, do you? Brothers, how many of y'all have had your wives influence you to do something that you knew that God was not leading the family to do? How many of y'all had your wives influence you to make a purchase that was not in the will of God for their timing in your financial house in order. And you made the purchase and you struggle to make the payment. Anybody in the house? You don't have to raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass anybody in this place today. But it happens all the time. Or the hug, or the, or the, or the, or the it, it can be the other way around. Can I get it with the husband influences the wife, whatever, and to make a purchase that's not in line with God's will. Guys, here's what happened. Abraham said unto God, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Now, God, God, God corrects him in this next verse. He says, and God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. And with his seed after him, with his seed, the seed that comes from Isaac. The name Isaac means he laughs. Everybody say he laughs. See, the, 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 you know, when you look at Sarah, the, 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 the name Sarah that he changed it to, S-A-R-A-H, literally means princess or noble woman. Amen? Because naming something, I told you before, meant something during biblical days. Naming, a name meant something. And, and, and it's just more than just something you just threw out there arbitrarily. It meant something. And so Sarah, when he had her change her name to princess, a noble woman, God clearly said that kings of people would come forth out of Sarah. And he said, in order for a king to be a king, he must have a royal lineage. And so he changed her name. So in changing her name, God established Sarah as a royal mother of nations, along with the father Abraham. Can I get a witness? 
See, God specifically declared that something incredibly special was going to happen through Sarah. In doing so, God gave Sarah much more than a name. He gave her her destiny, guys. And see, God has a destiny for every last one of you all that are sitting here who name the name of Christ. There is a purpose and a plan that God has for your life. And he's wanting you a very, very badly to get on course and to begin to walk this faith journey so that he can use you to fulfill your God-ordained destiny, guys. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you just like he was waiting on Abraham and Sarah to get to the position to where they could actually fulfill the promise. Now, now, and and here in this 21st chapter, when we go back to the 21st chapter of Genesis, we see her destiny being fulfilled. Because God God even, uh, again, if if you keep moving through this this story from 17 to the 18th chapter, God gave more specific details about the promised birth of Abraham's child by Sarah. And Sarah overheard the conversation. And her response was no different from her husband. She laughed, just like Abraham laughed. She laughed. And it, isn't it ironic that God told him to name the son Isaac, the one they, they initially couldn't believe, his name means he laughs. God has a sense of humor, right? You mess up, God said, okay, I'm going to remind you, amen, as long as you live, you're going to be reminded that, that at first you didn't believe my promise, but I am faithful to my word. You're going to name that boy Isaac, and this means he laughs. Come here, he laughs. You know what? That's what his name meant, guys. And what we got to understand is that God is faithful. Abraham laughed, Sarah laughed, and neither of them believed God could do what he said he was going to do. So, so, uh, you know, I I can imagine that that this is similar to what we do as well in our own individual lives. How many of y'all ever laughed at God's promise? Oh, no, no, I I know you in church, you amen it. I know when you're here, you, you, will, you, you will lift up holy hands, gl- glory to God. You'll hear those songs that they sing like, uh, you know, I will make room for whatever, you know, whatever's in my way, I got to move it out the way. That's the song that you said, right? But how many of y'all realize that there are many Christians who are not making Jesus their number one priority? They're allowing work, careers, stuff, people to get in the way of God. And God is saying, I need you to make me my, your number one priority. I need you to believe that I am the God, Lou, who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in you. Amen. And that's what God is working on to bring Abraham to this point where he can believe and receive the promise that God had given him. Amen. Early on, 25 years ago, we see it begin to come to pass. Now watch this. Again, she laughed because she didn't think God understood the facts. How many of y'all have said, well, you know, I understand what you're saying, but pastor, but here's the facts. How many of y'all have ever looked at what you looked at and said, I know what you're preaching, pastor. I know what you're saying, but here's what I'm dealing with. Here's the facts, pastor. I, I, I only see so much money in my bank account. Here's the facts, pastor. My child is wayward and, and I've been dealing with it for the last 10, 15 years, and it looks like it's not going to happen. Those are the facts, God. Uh, Pastor, I know know what you're preaching, but here's what I'm dealing with. My my husband is acting up. My wife is acting crazy. And Pastor, that's what I'm dealing with. I know you say believe God, but you don't see what I see. Well, the facts, when you look at Sarah's situation was that she was old. Everybody said she was old. No woman, what, 90 years old got in the business having a wife? Not a wife. Having a baby. Yeah, no woman, no, no matter how old she is, has in the business having a wife. <laughs> Can't get away with it. You need to have a husband. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Are y'all with me today? The, the, those were the facts. She was old and nothing could change that. Let me tell you, I don't care how, 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 how young you try to keep yourself. At some point in time, your hair will tr- turn gray unless you get Miss Clairol or some other dying dad. You live on this earth long enough, it's going, it's going, it's going, it's going, it's going, it ain't going to be black anymore. You know what? That's one reason why I keep my hair cut low. You know, I keep it low like that. Gre- Kevin, you can't see the gray, man. So I just keep it cut low so it looks like, you know, just going on. But you know, at some point in time, if I let it grow, it's going, there's some gray in there. 
And you can, you can, you, I don't care how Holy Ghost filled you are. I don't care how much you speak in other tongues and dance across this church. When you get old, your body's going to change. Can I get somebody north of 50 to say amen? amen? And you that 25 that think it's going to stay that way, just keep on living. As the old folks say, just keep on living. I told the other week, some stuff drops, stuff get wide, stuff get different, discombobulated. Can I get one amen? amen? Stuff don't look like the way it used to look. Praise God, we still love you. God still love you. Your wife and your husband still love you. But it changes. All right, all right. So she's old. That was a fact. But I want y'all to go with me to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Verse number 18. Let's look at that right quick. 1 Corinthians 8, chapter, verse number 18. The first chapter, verse number 18. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 18. Those were the facts. But guys, the facts and the promise don't always line up. In fact, they rarely do. The facts and the promise rarely line up. It made no sense for them to, in the natural, believe that at 190, this was going to come to pass. But God gave the promise 25 years earlier. And we see as we go into this 21st chapter that the promise is coming to pass. But I want to, I want to show you why God does what he does and how, why he does it the way he does it. Because he, he's, 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 God is fooling with pride for man. And pride for man always tries to take credit for whatever goes on in his life. And God is the God, he's not going to share his glory with none of us. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care what position you hold. That don't make you anything in the sight of God. We are as filthy rags. Our righteousness is as filthy rags before the, the holy throne of God. Watch what the text says, and I want you to follow this right quick as we move through this thing. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the what? Very power of God. People think you are crazy for coming to church every week. People think you're out of your mind for trusting in the transformative power of the cross of Calvary to get your relationship with God right. They think it's a bunch of stuff you got to do to be right with God. And my salvation and my righteousness for God is not based on how good I am. I thank God it's not because I'm not good enough. But it's through the saving work of Jesus Christ. But we who are being saved know it's the very power of God. Next verse, read. Come on, let's read. Say, as the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligence. That's what God says. He says, I'm going to mess up folk who think they're smart and keep figuring me out. He says, so where does this lead the philosophers? Listen to this. Where does it lead the philosophers, the scholars, and, and the doctoral uh, thesis people, and, and the world's brilliant debaters? Where does it lead them? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Watch this, read on. It says, since God and his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. You got saved because someone told you about the salvation work of Christ on Calvary. You got saved, your life was transformed, and people are still trying to figure out, how is that? I know that boy. I know what she used to do. I know how she used to be. I know how he was, but there's been a transformation that has taken place in that person's life. I know it. Since God and his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through his human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Let's keep reading. Come on, let's go. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. Look at the text. It says, so when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's nonsense. Look at the next verse. Come on, let's read. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let's keep reading, guys. Watch this. This is good. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Next verse says what? Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. See, when Jesus called a bunch of fishermen and carpenters and some, some guys who were not theologians to gospel ministry, that didn't make sense in that word. As a matter of fact, there are those who were religious theologians who were wondering how could these guys speak with so much wisdom and they don't have the education that we have. 
Now, I'm not knocking education, but education doesn't, doesn't mean that you, you're wiser than God. God says, God will take, watch this. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that fear you were wise in the world's eyes are powerful or wealthy when God called you. Next verse says what? Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to do what? To shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. Look at this next verse, let's read. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing. Some of you sitting there right now know you were counted as nothing. Even your own family didn't think very much of you, but look at what God is doing through you today. Look how God is transforming your life and moving in such powerful ways to get you to, to be a, a purveyor of kingdom principles. He's doing that. He's using you. Yeah, you're the one in class that everybody thought, hang on. He didn't get voted most likely to see. He got voted most likely to not do nothing. But here you are. God is using you. He takes the foolish thing in this world to confound the wise. Look at, look at the next verse. Come on, let's read. God, it says, as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Why does God do that? So nobody can boast that I did it based on my sports and my career and my skill sets. He'll take something that's foolish to confound the wise. So the facts, the facts of the matter oftentimes will challenge our faith that God's going to fulfill his promises. The facts are real. They're irrelevant. However, the question that we got to ask is when you're, when you're faced, come on, with your own Sarah-like situation, the question you got to ask is this. Are you going to believe the facts or are you going to believe the promise? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I need to know. Just look at them real quick and say, I need to know. Are you going to trust the facts? Or are you going to trust God's promise? See, when, when it comes to God's word and his promises, the facts alone don't tell the whole story unless you let them. I said unless you let them. Can I get a witness? Don't let yourself get too caught up in the facts God is trying to get you to embrace the promise. If you can embrace the promise like Abraham and Sarah ultimately did, now they had some, they had, they had some, 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 some mess ups along the way, but they ultimately got to the point where they trusted the promise. And guys, let me tell you something. God is trying to get all of us to embrace the promise. And that's what Sarah and Abraham ultimately did. And that's why in this 21st chapter, we see the fulfillment of the promise coming into manifestation. Guys, I'm going to tell you this. Most of the time, God delays the fulfillment of his promise until you and I are no longer tied to the facts. I'm going to say it again. Most of the time, God delays the fulfillment of his promise until you and I are no longer tied to and trusting in the facts. Just as Israel took 40 years to cover ground that should have taken 30, them 35 days, you can wander in a circle of unbelief until you're ready to trust God. Aren't you tired of just work? You ought to get tired of doing this. Some of y'all, your faith walk is just like this, going in circle, and now you're getting dizzy because you're going in those circles, and now you're stumbling. Oh, I almost stumbled, guys. Help me, help me, help me. You keep going in circles, and God says, oh, hang on just a second. Let me, let me calm down. Hey, listen, God says, I need you to trust me with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. The facts are the facts, guys. And I'm not saying that you should dismiss the facts or deny them. Just never let the facts override the promise because God is greater than the facts. God is greater than your upbringing. God is greater than any racism that comes against you. God is greater than that guy that don't like you. God is greater than your family member who's trying to pull you down so they can look better. God is greater than all of that. So he says, don't come to me with what you think is holding you back. Are you willing to trust my word? Facts alone will lock you into a natural frame of mind, but faith alone will move you into a supernatural state of mind. Y'all remember what, what, what God said in Hebrews 11 and 6? But without faith, it is impossible to please God. The person that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a what? Rewarder of them that do what? Diligently seek him. So we know that God's ways are not our ways, right? But he will let us delay our destiny if we're too focused on doing things our way simply because we can't imagine any other way. 
What God is trying to do through our, through our faith journey is to get us to transform the way we think. Because God changes us by changing the way we think. So we got we to gotta start thinking like people of faith and not people of natural means. We live in a natural world, but we have a supernatural God who says, I can bring it to pass. Can I get a witness? So look at you, as we go through our outline, we, today we're going to talk about rewarded faith, rewarded faith, how God fulfills his promise, rewarded faith. First thing I want you to make a note of is, is God proved himself, he proved his word, and he proved his power. If you go back to verses 1 and 2, let's read it one more time. In Genesis 21, verse 1 through 2, God proved himself, he proved his word, and he proved his power. Text says this, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. That's critical. Don't miss that. The Lord visited Sarah, everybody say, as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had what? Spoken. See, God is a creator, and part of his creation ability causes him to speak words. The Bible says we serve a God who does what calleth those things which be not as though they already are. God chooses to speak. He said, let there be light. Guess what? And light was because what? God said it. Death and life is where in the power of the tongue and they that love it eat the fruit thereof. So if we're made in the image and likeness of God, we got to start speaking what we believe. We got to start speaking, amen, the promises of God over the situation rather than speaking what we see in the natural. Can I get a witness? So, so we got to get to that point where we are speaking like God does, amen. God proved himself, his word, and his power. God uses his power to do exactly as he had promised. God kept his word here because the text says he, he, he visited Sarah as he has said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Verse number two, let's read again. It says what? For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time, at the set time. Everybody said at the set time. See, there, 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 there is a set time for certain things to transpire in our lives. How many of y'all thought you were ready for something in your life that you wasn't ready for? Anybody been there before? How many, you know, I mean, I, I, I go back to when I was a little boy playing up and down Old Bellevue Road with Gary Johnson and the rest of these guys, and we were riding a bicycle, but we made our own chop. Any of y'all ever had a bike where you cut the, the forks off another bike and stick it on the end of it, and you made a, what they call a chopper? Y'all know what a chopper is? That's a, that's a, a motorcycle that has those long uh, forks at, at the end. We made our own bicycle choppers, and we thought we were riding motorcycle, but guess what? At 10 years old, we were not ready to ride a motorcycle at that point. We thought we were, but we were, not, we were not ready. Many times in our own life, guys, you, we think we're ready for something that God says, no, nah, you're not quite ready yet. How many of y'all have kids who think they're ready for a car at 17, but they can't even, come, they can't even uh, do their homework on time? How many of y'all got kids who, who, who think it's a rite of passage when they turn 16 to get a brand new car? And they're not even responsible enough to even clean up their own room. Do y'all have children that don't clean up their own room? Oh, so, oh, oh y'all, y'all like that. Well, you know, brother pastor, you know, I just, I believe that they, I need to let them be themselves and, you know, they got to grow into their own, grow into your own. You're going to grow into your own, all right. Get in there and clean up that room. You're not playing any rent and part of your, part of your ability to stay here means you keep the doggone room clean. Hello? You're not paying any mortgage. You're not paying any electricity. Keep the room clean. That's for some. I don't know who that's for right now. You may have a 55 year old still standing in your house and won't clean his own room. That's your fault, parent. Come on. If you got a teenager and they, and they won't clean their own room, it's your fault. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's our fault, parents, because we allow that to happen. Come on. There's some time I have to get on my own children, and they're they, they, they good and grown now. One thing I can't stand is an overrunning trash can. Yeah, that's just, can I, can I give y'all my pet peeve? And then time I would go into Sandra's room or, or Junior's room and the trash can is overflowing. You can't get nothing else in there. That just bothers me. 
Does that bother anybody else in here? Like, am I the only one that way? Am I weird like that? Some of y'all say, well, that's what trash came for. You put trash in it, but you got the empty the doggone thing. So, so guys, listen, when that, when, when, sometimes we think we're ready for stuff that we're really not ready for. And we as parents know that with our children. And guess what? God, our Father, knows it with us when we're asking for things that we're really not ready for because we hadn't went through the process. You got to go through the process. Every high school player who leaves high school to go to play in college thinks they're ready to start day one when they get down there. But physically, they're not even ready. Most cases. Now, sometimes you have guys who, who are mature beyond their age and they, they hit it off as a freshman. But by and large, most guys have to go through the training, weight training, nutrition process to get their bodies developed to be able to compete on another level. Because everybody was a high school star when they got there, when they came from their school. So, but sometimes people don't want to go through the process of development and they turn it loose and they quit. Guys, don't be like that when it comes to the things of God. Abraham and Sarah went through a process and God had to get them ready because he chose them to bring the seed that was going to be born in Bethlehem through that family lineage. And he had, you know, if, if, if and, and God's this way, God knows, amen, what's going to happen before it ever happens. But he knew he had to get Abraham to a point where he was walking by faith and not by what he saw. Amen. Although Abraham and Sarah laughed when God told them that he would do what he would do through them, they had been introduced to a greater level of God's power the second time around when God came around. 25 years had passed since God first made his promise known and two major events had taken place. This is on your note, but just write these down. In these two events, God revealed to Abraham and Sarah just how powerful he is. Because again, we said God proved himself, his word and his power. First thing was, the first event took place in Sodom and Gomorrah when God destroyed the two major powerhouse cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He showed Abraham and Sarah that nothing is too difficult for him. That's the first thing. Second thing we covered last week is when in the second event over in Genesis, the 20th chapter, verse 17 and 18, when Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech. Because remember, when Abimelech took Sarah to be in his harem, God intervened and came to him in a dream and said, listen, that, that, that's, that's not right. That's not right. You took a man's wife and God spoke to him in his dream and told him what he did was wrong. And God cursed his family to the point to where not only would his wife not be, his wife couldn't bear children, but everybody in the household, including servants, were now barren and could not have children. And I don't know. Again, back then, that culture, that was considered to be a curse if a woman could not birth a child into the earth realm, especially if she couldn't have sons. So we see here, now watch what God does here because he's trying to put faith in Abraham and particular Sarah. The, the, the Bible says when Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his, and his maids so they could bear children, for the Lord had closed fast all the wounds of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And what God was doing was showing Sarah that, listen, if I can close and open those wounds, don't you think that I can open your womb to fulfill the promise that I gave you almost 25 years ago? He, they saw that. They saw God's power in destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, and they saw God's power in opening up the wounds of Abimelech's family that had been closed by God. And that's significant because Sarah saw that and it stimulated her faith. See, sometimes we have to see God moving in other folks' lives Amen. For it to, 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 to beef up our faith. I, I don't know if she's here today, but yeah, I think, uh, is Mandy here? Uh, yeah, that's Mandy. I, I, I always think back to Sister Neal um, when she was believing God for her, her child care business. And y'all pray for all child care business because that's, they're, in, they're in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fix here. And I say in a fix, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a complicated situation when you got children can't go there in and, and, and school and that type of thing. So we need to pray for this country that, that, that God heals the land. And we, in like 2 Second, Second Chronicles 7 and 14 said, if my people, not the world, but if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and do what? Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and do what? Heal what? The land. That's what it says. 
I may have been off a few words there, but look it up, we go. gone. That's our prayer connect Wednesday based scripture. Listen, guys, God is able to heal, but we got to do our part as, as, as members of the body of Christ. Can I get a witness? So, so we look at this thing. Again, let's go back. Her faith is being stimulated as a result of her seeing this come to pass. So the first thing we said was, when we look at this text, rewarded faith, God proved himself, his word, his power. And he, he, he gave these examples here to stimulate them. He, he showed them Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed, and he sold, sold, sold them God, uh, uh, not only shutting up the wounds of Abimelech's family, but he sees, Sarah sees him opening the wound. Don't you think that was, a, don't you think for one second that she didn't take notice of that and say, my wound has been shut up for 24 years. And I see God is able to open wounds, and so now I got faith that he can do it. If he did it for Mandy, after 12 years of standing in faith for the opening of a bit, 12 years of believing God, a process where she went and, and, and through that process at first was maybe turned down, but now God opened the door of opportunity for her. And he's prospering her business because she stood in faith. And there are others of y'all out there who need to hear the testimony of others. That's why it's important that you, whenever you go through something, don't keep it to yourself. Tell what the Lord has done for you because your testimony can inspire somebody else to believe God and stand in faith. But a lot of us may like we ain't went through anything. A lot of us won't tell about the struggles we had in our relationship and we want everybody to think that we've been smiling and cheating at each other all this time. Y'all know y'all used to fight like cats and dogs since you've been saved. But if, but if you put God's word into play and, and begin to see that work in your marriage or in your life or on your job, then when you share what the Lord has done, that inspires somebody else. To say, if he did it, for Rod White, if he did it for Tony White, if he did it for Brenda Vincent, if he did it for Faye Lampkin, if he did it for uh, uh, Kay Bryant, if he did it for Kelvin Boyd, he can do it for me. Because God is not a respected person, guys. So reward of faith, God promised him, God proved himself, his word, and his power. The second thing we see is God stirred obedience and faithfulness. Amen? Because guys, let me tell you something. Faith is so critical to God that he will intentionally take you through various scenarios and difficulties in order to build your faith. Because faith comes by hearing him by the word of God. But, but, but faith that has never been really tried and tested can't be determined if it's genuine or not. How do you know if you really have faith but it's never tested? All you did is sung about it. We come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He never failed me yet. Oh, 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 can't turn around. We come this far by faith. Any of y'all remember that song? I need, to, I need to see the hands of some old school folk who remember that song. Some of you young folk remember, what are you talking about, but pastor? We sang that, we sang that song quite often in, in the church we come this far by faith, but are you really sure? Because I don't know that my faith is genuine until I have to walk through something where I, can't, I don't have the means or the resources to make it happen. If I have the means and the resources to make it happen on my own, I don't really need faith. And what God is going to do in all of our lives, because what he wants to do through us is going to require us to be people of faith. He will take us through circumstances and situations, no matter how different they may be, in order to build our faith. It's that important to him. Because he says without it, we can't please him. Not only that, he will wait as long as it takes for that faith to bring forth life in your individual situations, because you keep walking by what you see and what you said, and it don't make sense. Faith ain't never made sense. You think it made sense for a hundred-year-old man to have a baby with a 90-year-old woman? That don't make sense. A lot of the stories in the Bible we can go back and look at, it don't make sense to be in the middle of a lion's den, a, a den of hungry lions, and have their mouths shut by God to where when they look in, in the lion's den, Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel comes out of the lion's den unscathed. It don't make sense when three Hebrew boys are thrown in a fiery furnace. Come on now. 
in a fiery furnace to be executed. And then when they looked in, in the fiery furnace, they said, well, we put three in, but it looked like four of them in there. And that fourth one looked like the son of God. The pre-incarnate Christ, they're with those boys in the fiery furnace. It didn't make sense that not a hair on their head was singed, but faith don't make sense. It just works. Faith just works, amen. I've learned how to walk by faith and not by sight. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the fact says. I know what my God promised, and his promise rises above the facts. But God said we got to learn how to walk that way because too many of us in here are walking by what we see, what we can feel, what we can, what we can figure out. And God says, I got to get you to the point where you can walk by faith. See, the principle of faith that applied to Sarah applies to you and me as well. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, his promises to you are yours by faith. Don't be limited by the facts, guys. Don't be limited by what you can see. So God stirred obedience and faithfulness. How does God fulfill his promises, guys? He stirs obedience and faithfulness to himself. Abraham's joy, can, you can't imagine the joy that he experienced when this thing came to pass here. Look, look, look with me, if you will. Let's, let's look at verses 3 and 5 of Genesis chapter 21. Come on, let's go. Got to move. The long wait for this son, 25 years, was over. The wait is over. It's my time. Is what Abraham, I believe Abraham was singing something along that line. The wait is over. Watch what the text says here. It says, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. text says, and Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac being eight days old. That's according to the promise of the sign of the covenant. So here he is. He's been obedient to what God told him. God says, on the eighth day, you circumcise every male, the foreskin of the male genital. You circumcise him on the eighth day to show that you are still in covenant with me. Amen. Uh, as God had commanded him. Next verse says what? This is obedience, y'all. See, you, you can say you got faith, but if you're not walking in obedience, you don't really have faith. Faith, amen, is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things that are not what seen. So God stirred obedience and faithfulness in him when he brought this promise to pass, amen. God, amen, uh, you know, God actually is moving in Abraham's life now, and he's brought this promise to pass. What is the focus here, guys? Abraham's obedience to God. I don't want you to miss this. He was obedient to God. This is very significant. For, for God would not have fulfilled, guys, his promise to Abraham if Abraham had not been an obedient follower of God. Abraham obeyed God throughout his life, not perfectly, which none of us do. How many of y'all will be honest with me and say, you know, Pastor, you know, there's some times when I'm walking with the Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good, I'm following his command, and there are other times when, when Pastor, I kind of I, I, you know, I, I didn't see it, and so because I didn't see it, I, I, I tried to figure it out myself. I went my own way. I did something. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I, Pastor, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't really pursue God. I got nervous because what I saw, and what I saw made me nervous, and I figured I had to move and do something, and I didn't wait on God. Is there anybody's testimony? If, am I the only one that's ever done that? Am I the only one that's ever moved without really getting a confirmation that this is what the Lord wants? And every time, I mean, I'd be doggone it. I just did that again. And I know better because every time I wait on the Lord and be of good courage, he strengthens my heart. Guys, we got to see, we got, what the focus is obedience. So, so number two, we see in our outline that God stirred obedience and faith. The third thing, God stirred joy and rejoicing over his power. Look at verses six and seven. God stirred joy and rejoicing over his power. Because guys, we got to get to the point in our families to where we are not allowing the dysfunction to disrupt the faith building process that God is trying to take our families through. You, your children, your mama, your daddy, everybody who relates to you and, 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 and your family at the church and your work family and the family of Americans who live in this country. God is saying, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, God allowed the pandemic to allow for a reset. A reset with the church. And some of y'all out there still thinking, we're going to go back to the way it used to be, and I'm just ready to get back. Let me tell you something. Back may not be what you think it is. Because I believe God was, I, I don't believe, I know God was somewhat disappointed with the church in the way we've handled ourselves. And the way we've been doing church obviously has not been as effective as it could be when you, look, when you compare what we're doing today to the early church. 
the early church, and man, when they preached the sermon, 3,000 souls came to the Lord in one setting. And some churches are lucky to get one soul in five years. Something's not right. Look at your own family. Look at your own life. Something's not right. I, you know what? I, I, I really, I kind of, I thank God for what he's doing. I, I'm realizing he's doing some different things in me during this pandemic. You know, I, I, I've been energized during this pandemic. This reset has caused me to reevaluate myself and to reevaluate how we do ministry as a church. Some, I, I know some of y'all, it, 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 just, it, just, it, it just bug you to death that we wouldn't have Sunday school on Sunday. I, it's supposed to be on Sunday. It's got to be Sunday morning. It don't feel right on Monday. Who says it's got to be Sunday morning? People ain't going to come if it ain't Sunday morning. Have you realized that we haven't changed Sunday school in 100 years? Do you think that maybe God is, wants to use a new method to get us to be more disciple one, discipline one? We had not changed Bible study since I've been here. Oh, we changed a little bit, I mean, 10, 15 years ago. But, but, but think about this for a second. If we don't change to adapt to a changing culture, we do not change the message, the message of Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, resurrected as the way to get to God never changes. But our methods have to change if we're going to reach this untoward generation that we have to try to reach. It's not the same as it was. And you keep trying to go back to 1975. I remember when. I remember when too, but we got to change. Now that makes some of y'all uncomfortable because we're not used to change. But I'm gonna tell you something, churches got to be different. There, there are churches who, 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 who are not sitting back sulking and, and, and being, being, being uh, upset because we can't get back together the way we used to get back together. And they, and they spend all their time bemoaning that fact when we, ought to, we, ought, we need to pivot. We need to reimagine how we're gonna reach people. And the way we reach people in 2020 is different than the way you reach people in 1965, 1975, 1985, even, even in 2005. So my question to you is, if God says we're going to pivot, we're going to reset, we're going to do it differently, can you go with God or are you going to be stuck with your, I, I got to have something on Sunday morning, Pastor. Because I can't get, I, I, I don't even feel right. That's, we ain't talking about what you feel. We're talking about what God is trying to do. God says, I want you to change. The Pharisees wouldn't change. They couldn't see what Jesus was saying because they were stuck on their tradition. They couldn't imagine that the gospel is going to the Gentile believers too. And the Gentiles got just as much right to God as they did. They thought they had a patent on God because after all, they were the nation that God chose to bring the Savior. The earth ran through. The very Savior they rejected, by the way, so guys, it's, it's, it's different. God is resetting. He's trying to do something with the church because I believe this slowdown has caused a lot of us, even as family units, to do some stuff that we hadn't done in years. First of all, some of y'all hadn't cooked in years. <laughs> and now you cooked a meal three times during the week. I, I, you ain't made the five yet. You, you cook three times, you're like, oh, Lord Jesus, what's happening? The rapture's on the way. Mama don't cook three times. We ate together three times this week. Oh, Jesus, what is happening? Different, different, spending time together. See, I believe God says, slow it down. You're running, you're doing ministry, you're working, you got involved in this. You're doing that, you're going there, you're going here and going there. And, and the truth of the matter is, what really is happening in a lot of our cases, we're going here, going there, doing stuff for the Lord, ain't spending no time with the Lord. We bragging on how busy we are. Child, I'm doing this, I'm involved in this, I'm involved. Some stuff, you, you may need to call back and say, God said, okay, sit down and rest a little while. I need you to think about growing in me. Stop being religious and let's start growing. I need you to become a kingdom disciple. Amen? So if things look different, I don't want you complaining because that ain't what you used to. God is trying to get you unused to what you used to because what you used to maybe is not being as effective as it could have been, but you want to hold on and you'll, you'll, some folk will let it die out rather than change. 
That's why you see churches a lot of times dying out rather than changing the way they do ministry to meet the demands of an ever-changing generation. The message doesn't change, but guys, I'm here to tell you, our method and the way we reach people and the way we disciple people has to change. And that's uncomfortable for a lot of us. I'm talking to Doyle Adams too, y'all. I'm not just talking to you. I, 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 I like to be that steady as you go guy. And I, but when God said move, you can ask my wife, when it's t- it may take me a long time to move, but when it's time to move, we're going to go get it. Saint, we were talking about moving this sound booth for three or four years, wasn't it? And then when God said it's time to move, let's move this doggone thing. Call Pat, come on, get, do this. Call Alan, get this thing built. Let's move it. Didn't take long. But I ain't going to move until God say move. I've learned how to trust him and be faithful. But sometimes I'm not moving because I got to watch myself because I'm, I, I, I don't, I don't. Come on, most of us, when we get north of 50, we don't like too much change, not, not quick change, isn't it? But God says, if, if you're going to reach people, I got to change how you're reaching. I'm still going to use the same gospel, but I got to change. So, so take advantage of this time period. You that are working at home, stop sleeping. Work at home. Do what you got to do so you can honor the Lord. I know I'm right about it. You ain't got to say nothing. You ain't got to say amen. I know I'm right about it. Some of y'all got to pay the man back. Pay him back for your, for, your, for your lack of diligence in working from home. Now, some of y'all do okay. Some of y'all say, well, Pastor, I worked at 2 o'clock at night. Yeah, but some of y'all sleeping on the job. Okay, that's for somebody who need to hear that. So God stirred obedience and faithfulness. God stirred rejoicing, joy and rejoicing. See, there was a great similarity between the birth of Isaac and the birth of Christ. The birth of Isaac actually was a foreshadowing or it was pointing to the birth of Christ because there were, there, there were, there were the, both of them were miraculous birth, two children, right? A hundred year old, 90 year old woman having a baby, that's miraculous. A virgin having a baby, that's miraculous. Can I get a witness? The, the, the times for both of those births were set or appointed by God. God set the time for Isaac's birth and he set the time for Christ's birth. It was the foreshadowing of the, of the birth of Christ to come. The, both Isaac and Christ were the promised seed or the promised son, okay? Isaac was the promised seed to Abraham and Christ was the promised seed, amen, that would come to be born in the manger of Bethlehem through, through the Virgin Mary. There was the assurance of God's power in both of those births. Both Sarah and Mary wondered how could they bear a child. It was just impossible. But when the angel came and told her and gave her another witness about Elizabeth, your cousin, got pregnant in her old age, then now she said, be it unto me according to thy word. Whenever you can say, God, I don't understand it. I don't feel it. I don't know how it's going to happen, but be it unto me, God, according to your word. Whenever you can get, get to the point where you say that about every promise in God's word, you'll begin to see it manifested in your life. Both children were named by God himself. He named Isaac. He laughs. And he named Jesus, amen, his own son, the savior of the world. Can I get a witness? And both children brought great joy to their mothers and caused their mothers to focus upon God and what he had done. Can I get a witness? So I'm going to stop here. And, and, and we're going to get through with me and my dysfunctional family before the, before the rapture takes place. <laughs> we're almost at that 22nd chapter. And that's where we're going to stop at that 22nd chapter. But there is so much rich meat in here, guys. I don't want you to miss what God is trying to do through this church. God is doing some unique things. And God needs all of us to be willing to be kingdom disciples. God said it's time out for us being church members. We got to be willing to be disciples. And those of y'all that are here and those of y'all that listen to me about, via live stream, God is saying it's time for you to step up. Some of y'all have been here 20 years and hadn't grown that much because you're not willing to be disciple. You're not willing to, to get into the book. You're not willing to be taught. You're not willing to be faithful and committed to the thing or the ministry that you signed up to be committed to. Not willing to be faithful to even do what you assign or you say that the Lord led you to do. Guys, we got we to become kingdom disciples. And the study that we get ready to go through by Dr. Tony Evans, 
it lays it out plainly what it means to be a kingdom disciple. And what God wants to do through this church is going to require us to not to be full of babies. We don't need baby Christians who wear their feet on their shoulder, get their feet hurt, want to cry, want to quit. It's time for you to step up and run with the Lord. You've been here, if you've been here five years, you should be growing. You've been here 10 years, you should be growing. If you've been here any period of time, there should be a growth process that's evident by your spiritual walk. And so as your pastor, guys, I'm going to challenge you. Let's don't sit on the sidelines. It's time for us to, to be out front, leading and bringing the family of God together, dealing with the dysfunctionality that's happening in the church. Are y'all with me? Are y'all ready to run? Oh, no, 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 no. Are you ready to run? Are you ready to get past your traditions, get past what you're used to and say, God, however you want to use me, use me in your service. However uncomfortable it may be, God, I'm willing to go with what you say let's go with. And that's what God is after. A servant who's willing to obey even when it doesn't feel good to them, to their flesh, but you know it's the spirit of God leading you. Every head bowed, everybody close. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time and this opportunity. You are a wonderful God and we love you. Father, we thank you that after 25 years you brought the promise into manifestation. Father, we, we trust and we believe and we know that you are God who hears and answers prayer. And I thank you right now, Lord, for this time. Thank you, God, for speaking to our hearts today. Lord, I pray that something was said to inspire each one of us to, to get out of ourself, to, to not walk in fear during this global pandemic. Fear has paralyzed many believers. And yes, Lord, we understand the times, we understand the precautions, but Lord, you told us not to be overburdened or to be you didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So, Lord, I pray right now that no one in this building, no one is listening by way of live stream, will allow fear to overtake them to the point that where they can't trust you to see them through. Lord, there are challenges that are happening in all of our lives. And all of us have difficulties. And all of us are going through things that are part of the faith building process. Lord, I just pray and trust that you will help each one of us to be able to stand tall in faith. You gave your son to die on the cross for our sins. He was crucified, buried, and resurrected the third day morning with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. And Lord, he's given us the ability to walk in that divine power. So we thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. In the name of Jesus, we pray glory to God. Now as your head is still bowed and eyes closed, if there be one who has never made a commitment to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you today to, if you will, to make that commitment right now. You can be saved today. If you're here and you're not sure if you were to die right now, or if you're listening via live stream and not sure that if you were to die right now, where you would spend eternity, I promise you, if you'll trust Jesus, he will come into your heart and save you. So if you want to be saved, just believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. Believe it. First of all, believe that you need to be saved. Don't be prideful and think you're good enough to get to heaven on your own. Because none of us are. But trust that what Jesus did on Calvary's Hill, his sacrificial death will give you an opportunity to get into the kingdom. And if you ask him to come in, he will. But now here, here, here's the real appeal. That's, that, that's the first real appeal, salvation. But here's the second one. I want you to listen to me carefully. I sense that God is calling on us in this building to begin to walk in supernatural faith. I believe that God is calling many of you in here to do something that you have been uncomfortable doing. I don't know what it is, but God said it's time for you to walk in faith. And maybe you've been a little fearful. Maybe you, maybe you haven't, maybe you have stepped back from the faith walk. You're doing church, but not really walking in faith. And I want, I want you to stand in your feet. I'm gonna pray for your mindset because Faith coming by hearing him by the word of God. 
And it comes from being encouraged by others. But if you're sitting here today, you say, Pastor, I know my faith walk is not where it needs to be. Stand on your feet. I want to pray for you as you get into God's Word. Come on, stand on your feet. If there is something that God is calling you to do, but you don't understand how, you, don't know, you may not understand the means or who he's going to connect you with to do it, stand on your feet. I want to pray with you right now because what God is saying today is that I want you to be available to move when I say move. God is saying, when I reveal my will and the promise to you, you may not understand how I'm going to do it, but just trust that I'm going to do it. Is there another? Come on, come on. This, 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 this is time for transformation. God wants to transform this church and he wants us to be that vessel that he can utilize to advance kingdom principles. He wants to disciple us. He wants us to come out of our comfort zone Yes, he does. He says, I want to use you, EBC, to be on the leading edge of the change that I'm trying to bring to the church. Glory to God. Let's pray right now. Father, we thank you and we praise you. And we lift you up and begin the glory down in the majesty. You are an awesome God and you are worthy to be praised. We magnify you, God. I pray for those who are standing right now. God, you know the individual the standing. God, you know the faith walk. You know the challenge to their faith that they're experiencing right now, God. You know that you're trying to get them out of what they're used to and get into what you want them to do and you want all of us to do. And God, I'm standing for myself along with them. God, I know that you are transforming this church from the inside out. And God, give us the strength and the courage to walk with you even when we don't understand you. God, faith means that sometimes we don't understand what's going to happen. We don't understand the way, and we just, but we're just going to trust you that you're going to bring us, amen, through and help us to be able to accomplish those things you set our hearts and our minds to accomplish. Thank you now, Jesus. We praise you. Thank you for strength. Thank you for courage. And God, we're going to believe that we're going to be strengthened by the word to walk by faith and not by sight. For we love you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, we declare the victory. All those in agreement said amen. Come on, give him a hand of praise. Come on, bless him, bless him, bless him. Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank God for you today. We thank God for those who, who, who view in the video live stream. Hey, don't forget, uh, this coming Wednesday, we'll have another session of Real Talk, Racism in the Church. We have a panel that, that, that uh, shared some insightful things with us. So tune in Wednesday at 7. Next Wednesday, we got, I, I got a treat for you. My, my good friend, my buddy, Pastor Tim Ross, is going to be here to record uh, for uh, the following week. And you don't want to miss this brother. He's been coming and sharing with us for 20 plus years. He actually pastors a church that uh, an African-American pastor in a multi-ethnic church in urban Texas. 60% African-American and 40% white and other. So, so, so we want to hear how he's doing and what he's doing and, and share some, some insightful pointers with us as a church body because we're, we've been called upon to be not bystanders, but called upon to be a part of the change that God is trying to institute in the church. So Brother Tim will be here uh, to record that and that'll be shown not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. So we, we ask you to tune in and, and reach out and begin to, to, to Seek out relationships where you can begin to be honest with people and have crucial conversations. I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do. Uh, and I trust that you are willing to go along on this journey. Amen. So live stream artists, God, thank God for you. We, we look forward to seeing you on next Sunday as we continue with me and my dysfunctional family. God bless you. See y'all next week on the live stream. Glory to God.